Hey, it's Jack here. Today we're in downtown Las Vegas at the Mob Museum. The Mob Museum is a na considered the National Museum of Organized Crime and Law Enforcement. Former federal building, federal courthouse building, and a former U.S. Post Office. It was used from 1933 to 2005, where it was converted into a museum. Cornerstone of the building was laid in 1931, and the building was officially opened in 1933. A.W. Mellon, Secretary of Treasury. James A. Wetmore, Acting Supervising Architect. See the remnants of the post office that was here at one time with all the P.O. boxes. Just above that are all the signs for the Mob Museum. This wall talks about the beginnings of the Mob in America. There's a film on the other side of the wall that talks about how the prohibition in the 1920s that the mob mafia was supplying the booze. This room is set up like a file room with exhibits inside the file cabinets. California gambling ships anchored three miles off of Santa Monica and Long Beach and they have chips from those ships and matchbooks, the Black Hand murder case, Black Hand trial postcards, and they have a wiretap set. Here's some of the early gaming boards with advertisements. There's a national pastime mass produced gambling books and games were com popular across the country. Right here they got this map for connecting the dots. It was called Organized Crime for a Reason. Individuals and gangs were connected in a highly structured criminal network and syndicate. And with the dots, you see how it stretches from west to east, east to west, and somewhere in between. This room here is dedicated to the birth of Las Vegas, a tough little town. Senator Clark sold his land, hence the reason we have Clark County, Arizona Club. Please don't waste the water. We have to buy it. Original Las Vegas, right here. Original plan for Las Vegas was to have block 16, block 17 for gambling, drinking, and other vices. Its saloons aggressively competed for customers. Some establishment of block 16 soon took the step of including prostitution. Western Air Express began air mail service between Las Vegas and Los Angeles in 1926. While the train was 10 hour journey, the flight took a little over two hours. Here's a map of Las Vegas from 1939. Completed in 1933, this is what the building looked like at that time. It's employee identification tags for those who worked at Hoover Dam. Right next to that over here, we have a cable that was part of the Hoover Dam construction. Hoover Dam souvenirs got a pewter platter, letter opener, this little burrow here, there's other amusement parks like Knott's Berry Farm and Calico that use a similar burrow, they just put their name on the side of it. Some of the original gambling devices from Las Vegas. Well, they have the campaigns for prohibition. This is a Carry Nation hatchet. This is a Tommy gun. Here's some anti-prohibition sheet music. They have this whole room dedicated to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which was the deadly mob, deadliest mob hit in America. Here are the victims. And they actually have actual bullets taken from the scene. So all the victims were hit between six and 23 times. They actually have the autopsy report of where the bullet struck. This part of the museum is dedicated to the G-Man, Elliot Ness, Elmer Irie. And here's someone who I think everybody's heard of. This is J. Edgar Hoover. G-Man outfit and toys for kids. There's Dick Tracy, special FBI operative. And here's a G-Man original tin and wood submachine gun. And the G-Man tin pursuit car. Some of the weaponry used to fight crime. Got a 1921 Thompson submachine gun, Tommy gun at the top, 1897 Winchester shotgun, and another Thompson submachine gun. One of the first bulletproof vests. 
This is one of Al Capone's revolvers. And 73 years after putting Al Capone in prison for tax evasion, IRS agents seized this gun in 2004 in a raid of a Kentucky illegal gambling den. A wall dedicated to fighting the tax dodgers. Here's Al Capone, that's what he eventually went to prison for was IRS tax evasion. Here's some of Al Capone's trial notes. And from December 21st, 1931, the final memo on the Capone case. Some original handcuffs, Mike Malone's handcuffs, who was an undercover agent. That was his pistol there. We go into this room, the tentacles spread. He says the mob goes to war. This is for World War II. Talking about the mob going to war. It's an interactive exhibit for organized crime. You can walk up and interact with the menu. Betting on horses was a tradition. The race wire, brilliantly simple, added an innovative new twist. The Sporting Life talks about boxing and Chicago White Sox, or Black Sox as it was referred to, and other rigged sporting events. Pray for Hollywood, question mark. Glamour and big budgets provided irresistible combination for the mob. Roots of mob influence in 1934 and dealing drugs. Talk about how they brought him in. I suggest going down the stairs if you're able to. Theme of the second floor is America Fights Back. This courthouse was used for the Cavaver hearings and those hearings were to probe into organized crime. In 1950, Estes Kefauver had a hearing right here in this building. That committee hearing was broadcast on TV, bringing the whole trial to the American home. So this is the actual courtroom where the committee hearing took place in 1950. Inside the original courtroom, they have a movie that runs. It's so informative of what the committee hearings were all about. Uh, if you want to read about that, you can do so on the internet. I'm not going to bore you with those details. Or come here to the Mob Museum and experience it for yourself in the original hearing courtroom. Who's got juice? Beyond the Strip. Tale of two cities. Las Vegas was much like any other 1950s boomtown and not. People walked dogs, mowed lawns, raised kids. Nearly half of the jobs in Las Vegas relied on the casinos. And this town is built on hospitality and very much to this day, most people work in the hospitality industry who live here in Las Vegas. Here's for Howard Hughes. I'll buy the place. Hughes bought the strip property shown here, the Frontier Sands and Silver Slipper. There's a picture of him there. And there's the original check for the purchase of the Silver Slipper, $5.36 million back in 1968. Here's some poker chips from a Landmark Hotel. First set of Landmark casino chips and tokens with the deepest respect. The contains graphic content to bypass exit through the doors to the left. We only kill each other. Murder with a message. These are this rooms dedicated to mob hits and uh, the far wall over there has pictures of various mob hits along the way. Won't give up close to those because there might be some people who are squeamish. Uh, here is a Nevada gas chamber chair. It's tools of the trade. Prison made weapons, a bunch of shanks, cost a boat of candlesticks. This is a Colt Woodsman 22 with a suppressor. Colt Automatic 32 and a Auto Ordnance 1911-45. Roy DeMiro Machetti and Ice Pick. He was a hitman for New York's Gambino crime family in the 1970s and 80s. And these are some of his weapons of choice. Down with floor number two, we're gonna go down to floor number one. This is dedicated to 100 years of made men and their associates. They've got photos 
of all those individuals along these walls. So where do mobsters go? They retire, go into exile, go to prison, go into witness protection, or they just die. A wall dedicated to wiretapping. As you hear them and you listen Organized crime today, the power of the drug industry has exceeded the power of the state. Men now operate outside the bounds of the government. They are armed with bazookas and assault rifles. Charles Bowden. Here's a wall dedicated to the U.S. agencies that target organized crime. Yeah, the FBI, DEA, IRS, Coast Guard, uh, BATF, Secret Service, Immigration, ICE, and Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. There's global watchdogs like Interpol, UNIDC, and Europol, and other government agencies for other countries. Over here we got counterfeiting and knockoffs. It's kind of fun which one is real and which one is fake. Now neither are running so we can't see the sweet pan and all that, but it ends up both of these are fake watches. And here we've got which ones are real, which ones are fake on the Ray-Ban glasses. And the sign says the authentic glasses are the ones on the left. The Harry Potter video game, all you video game people, it's like which one's real, which one's fake. And it says fake and real versions are fairly easy to disguise in the case. The pirate copy on the right is acquired at a nighttime street market in Taiwan. Yeah, it's kind of obvious. It's a homemade, looks like it's printed on a home printer, whereas the one on the left definitely looks like it's from the manufacturer. Louis Vuitton purse, which one's fake? You can see some differences there. This the one on the left has big buttons, the one on the right has small buttons across the top or rivets. And the one on the left actually looks like it's hand painted, whereas the one on the right looks like it's mass produced. The one on the right is actually the true one, the one on the left, is the counterfeit one. So we have these two shoes. They are Air Jordan high top shoes. Which one's real, which one's fake? Well, the one on the left or the bottom, that's the fake one. The one on the top is the real one. So these are other items from the wild, illegal wildlife trade, alligator skin purse, hippopotamus tusk, python skin belt, whale's tooth that's been scrimshot, a cobra, African dwarf crocodile purse. What happens when illegal trade products are found, they're actually sent to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services repository in Colorado. And like any good attraction, you exit out through the gift shop. Here they have a whiskey t-shirt. $26.99 for the t-shirt. And this is what that t-shirt looks like. You've heard the term bullet with your name on it. Well, I found the bullet with my name on it right here. Anybody who's watched my videos knows that I pick up collectible pins wherever I go. This will be coming home with me today. Exit out of the gift shop. They've got this area dedicated to the rise of the cartels. We got to information about Pablo Escobar and his takedown. Two people that were instrumental in taking down Pablo Escobar were Steve Murphy and Javier Pena. They've got information, or artifacts I should say, from their stuff here. And there's Steve Murphy's special agent ID. Steve Murphy's nine millimeter pistol. Here's a script from the show Narcos. On well, this wall is dedicated to the actors and actresses who have portrayed mob members or law enforcement in mob movies. You may recognize some of these faces and names and the TV shows and movies that they were portrayed. El Chapo's Great Escape and His Great Fall. Over here they have a model of how El Chapo escaped and how they were helping him out. They dug a tunnel. I went up to this building here and he got out. This is an actual hazmat suit and gas mask used in the TV show Breaking Bad. And this is also a screen used gas mask from the same show. 
If you're a Sopranos fan, you'll recognize this as Tony Soprano in casual mode. This was used in the HBO series, Sopranos. From the HBO series Boardwalk, this is Nick, Nucky Thompson's death suit. Next to that is a prop Tommy gun. From the movie Casino, here's a signed script from the movie Casino. World premiere tickets, thank you notes, and these are prop newspapers used in the film. Now we're going to go to the underground speakeasy and distillery. Down here are the pro carry hatchet nation. This is what the prohibition officers would use to break open the kegs that were being bootlegged. Sunken rum runner. Fish tank. And this is remnants of that ship. Here is a phone booth from the Four Deuces in Chicago. Original phone booth. Let's see what happens if I pick it up. Nope. Not even a dial tone. Well, that was a lot of fun walking around the Mob Museum here in downtown Las Vegas. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. We'll catch you on the next one. Mob Museum offers $8 parking for four hours. Their lot is small. The museum right now has been open about two hours and they've only got a couple spots left. For a more economical option, it's $10 for the day to park across the street at Binion's and they're hotel parking it is free if you patronize Binion's and go to a restaurant do some business at the casino or what have you they will validate your parking so you can park for free and the walk is not that far there's the Binion's parking now if we pan back around there's the mob museum